Operman Kafurka, my aide, woke me by knocking on the window of my automobile. Herr Mayor, the station master has a message for you, he said, and I willed my sleepy body and mind awake and looked about. My car was secured on a railroad flat car that was part of a train on which we had travelled through the night on our way to join General Venk's 12th Army, which was just being formed in the Hartz Mountains. I had slept in my car because it was more comfortable than anything else available. Thinking we would be near Leipzig by morning, I had left instructions for my orderly to wake me at Eilenburg so I could take a motorcycle and visit my wife Lilo and our infant son Klaus in Leipzig, and then catch up with the slow train in another city. We were not in Eilenburg, however, but in Bautzen. I stretched, got out of the automobile, climbed down from the railroad car and went into the station. You have a message, I asked the station master, Javol Herr Major, he said. I have received an order that your train is to be diverted north toward Berlin. His comment startled me. Has the railroad to the west been cut? I asked, searching for a reason we were being diverted north. The answer was no. Travel has been moving slowly but freely. I thanked him and returned to the train. They were probably just going to take us to Berlin and put us on a different route to the Hartz Mountains, but it killed my hopes of being able to visit Lilo and Klaus, it was against all regulations for me to visit them anyway, but I had decided not to pass up a chance to see them if it was possible. Well, now it was no longer possible. At about 11am we reached the south ring of the railroad circle around Berlin. We had just rolled into the subway station at Neukölln when the air raid sirens began to wail loudly. On checking with the station master I learned that we would not be able to continue until the air raid alert had ended. I posted sentries on the train and sent the rest of our men into air raid shelters in the vicinity. As operations officer of the 56th Panzer Corps, I was overseeing the transfer of the Corps staff from Silesia, where we had just been in combat against the Russians, to the Hartz Mountains. Oberstleutnant im Generalstab von Duffing, Chief of Staff of the 56th Panzer Corps and my immediate superior, had gone to the Hartz Mountains ahead of us with an advance party. Hauptmann Kafurka, Major Wolf, personnel officer of the 56th Panzer Corps, and I went into an air raid shelter that was occupied mostly by civilians, and the mood of the civilians was sober, yet composed. There was no joking, but they showed no resentment toward us for continuing to fight, as some civilians were beginning to do. As the alert continued and we heard no explosions, I decided to go out and have a look. The streets were empty, of course, and high overhead I could see Allied bombers passing over, and no German defences against them were in evidence. I looked at the wave of bombers and wondered, as always, if Michaelis, a Jewish friend with whom I had gone through Petri Gymnasium, whose family had moved to England in 1938, might be in one of them. Finally, at 4pm, all clear sounded, and everyone returned to the train. We pulled out slowly, but to my alarm, toward the east. When I received orders that we were to unload at Munchenberg, about 50 kilometres from the Russian front, it was obvious that we were going back into combat against the Russians, and my heart sank. We unloaded the train at Munchenberg, and I drove to Waldseversdorf, where I was told our headquarters were to be, and Oberstleutnant im Generalstab von Duffing was already there with the advance party. He was a rather small man with a wiry build and dark eyes. I think somebody has pulled rank on us, he said with just a trace of anger and bitterness in his voice. Apparently, we are trading places with another corps staff, one that has a commanding general. Our old commanding general had been reassigned, and our new one had not yet arrived. At Waldseversdorf, we learned that we were to relieve a panzer corps staff that commanded two divisions of army reserve here in the expected centre of the coming Russian offensive. We assumed that the commanding general of the corps that was being relieved had political pull at the supreme command of the army, and had managed to have his corps staff take our place in the Hards Mountains, and have us assigned to the Ninth Army in his place. The corps staff we were replacing knew the area, they knew the divisions, they knew the combat situation, and they had the necessary communications equipment. We, on the other hand, had arrived in a completely strange area, did not know anyone in the divisions assigned to us or any of the corps or division staffs on either side of us, and we had only about 50% of our telephone and 35% of our radio equipment because we had just been taken out of combat in Silesia. And with these handicaps, 
we were supposed to take over the very difficult task of leading a mobile defence against an enemy who had overwhelming superiority in both numbers and equipment. Our new commanding general, General of Artillery Helmuth Weidling, was on his way, but he had not yet arrived. Well, there was nothing we could do about it. Von Duffing and I took command of the core section of the front from our predecessors, who quickly disappeared. April 13, General Weidling arrived the next morning. A 1945 Von Duffing, who knew Weidling, coached me on Weidling's likes and dislikes, and I acted on Von Duffing's advice when I reported to Weidling, giving him a very brief and concise rundown on the situation. He was very nice, and I felt I had made a good impression on him. Since he relied on first impressions to form his permanent opinion of subordinates, it was very important for our future work together that I, as his operations officer, make a good first impression in the afternoon. Weidling took Wolf and me to look over the area and make contact with our own divisions and our neighbours. Weidling grilled us during the trip to find out how much combat experience we had and how much help we were really going to be to him. He seemed content with what he heard. The situation at the front showed continuing Russian preparation for an offensive across the entire front. The Russians had established three bridgeheads west of the Oder River, and we still held footholds on the east bank of the river at both Kustrin and Frankfurt. Aerial photographs showed one Russian artillery piece for every 10 metres of front. Large batteries of artillery, with 12 artillery pieces each, were posted in straight lines, along roads or railroads, without even any camouflage. The Russian guns would have provided a virtual turkey shoot for the Luftwaffe of previous years, but by now the Luftwaffe no longer existed as a fighting force, so the Russian artillery was in no danger. The Russians also had an endless supply of tanks and everything else. It was obvious that we had no hope of stopping them. At best, we would only be able to delay them. We estimated that the Russians outnumbered us 6 to 1 in infantry, 10 to 1 in artillery, 20 to 1 in tanks, and 30 to 1 in combat aircraft. General Weidling, Major Wolf, and I then drove to the hills north of Silo, which offered an overall view of the front at the Oder River, on both sides of Kustrin. This ridge of hills about 17 kilometres from the Oder, known as Silo Heights, was considered our second line of defence, except that no troops were available to occupy it. It was only a defensive line we would be able to fall back to. We also visited General Major Mummert, who commanded the newly formed Panzer Division Munchaberg, which was under our command for the coming operation. We found that the division's equipment was good but incomplete, and that the troops were trained and experienced but had been together only a few days. Panzer Division Munchaberg really was a makeshift force. The supreme command of the army had known for some time that the final attack would come here, on the road to Berlin, and every available soldier was sent to the town of Munchaberg, Panzer Division. Munchaberg was hastily organised from these troops that was the way divisions were often being formed at this late stage of the war. After dinner at the officers' mess at Panzer Division Munchaberg, we drove to the 20th SS Panzer Division, our other division for the coming fight. It was also not quite fully equipped and ready for combat, because it had recently been in fierce fighting with us in Silesia. All the combat SS units were Waffen SS, which means they were combat soldiers as opposed to the political SS units that ran the concentration camps. When we returned, I tried to call Lilo but could not get a connection. I then called my mother and learned that the American army was on the outskirts of Leipzig Siegfried. What shall I do? she asked plaintively. Stay at home and do nothing, I told her. If shooting starts, go to the basement and wait it out. If you try to leave, you will become just another refugee. Don't risk that, mother. What happens to refugees is cruel. The conversation was under surveillance. The lines were not supposed to be used for personal calls, and a woman's voice interrupted and asked the purpose of the call, so I had to cut the conversation short. I could only hope that my mother would be safe, and that Lilo and Klaus were still all right. I shook off the sense of impending doom and helplessness, and forced myself to concentrate on business. Our 56th Panzer Corps was now the Reserve Corps for the 9th Army, which was commanded by General Busser. The 9th Army's two other corps were in position at the Oder River and around the Russian bridgeheads. We were behind those two corps, kept in reserve for whenever there was a breakthrough or a situation that called for reinforcements. Russian Marshal Zhukov's offensive started at 5am on April 14, 
When the greatest massing of artillery in military history ever 40,000 guns opened up on our front. As reserve, we were behind the front line. We had a good view of the entire area, although we could see little more than where the action was taking place. General Busser had correctly guessed the timing of the Russian offensive, and at the last minute pulled our infantry out of the positions being shelled by the Russian artillery. We could see airplanes dropping bombs and artillery shells exploding, but very little more. Because of our combat experience, however, we could make an educated guess about what was happening. We could hear the roar of the Udielic, artillery, rockets, bombs, and we could see the depth of the battlefield and judge how well it could be defended. The massed artillery was awesome, and it was accompanied by increased air activity as well. Silo Heights was about 10 kilometres from the front, and the area between Silo and the Oda River was flat, open terrain, with no woods. Although the area was flat and unwooded, much of it was swampy and not a good area for tanks, so the Russians were somewhat restricted in what they could do. We spent the early hours of the battle preparing to conduct, perhaps they really did not know any more than they gave us, or perhaps they did not want us to know until the last moment for fear we might pull back too soon. A lot of people were secretly questioning why the government did not negotiate an end to such a hopelessly lost war, even if it meant unconditional surrender and the Ninth Army staff may not have trusted us. The Russians took three days to reach Silo, even with their vast superiority in men and artillery. They also had reconnaissance planes, which gave them an advantage that was not available to us. The hilly terrain on both sides of Silo, however, made the Russian advance more difficult. On the evening of the second day, our front line was still intact, but we could not tolerate their deep incursions without the breakdown of our defences. Our corps headquarters was in the basement of a villa in Waldseversdorf. Motorcycle runners were always ready to be dispatched at a moment's notice. They always knew where the divisions were, and when Weidling went somewhere, he always took one or two runners with him. He could not always be certain that the Russians were not listening in on the telephone, so he would send a runner with a message instead. Finally, at 6am on April 16, we became actively involved in the battle for Silo Heights by taking command of the divisions already fighting there, in addition to our own two divisions. From then on, we worked around the clock, catching an hour or two of sleep whenever conditions permitted. Our headquarters stayed where it had been, but Widling went to the divisions to have a look at the situation and conduct the battle from there, taking me with him. We drove to the headquarters of our two new divisions to discuss the situation with the division commanders. The headquarters of the 9th Parachute Division was under both artillery and mortar fire. At their division headquarters I ran into my good friend and former General Staff College classmate Major Engel, but unfortunately there was no time for small talk. The 9th Parachute Division commander was an Air Force General Lieutenant who was much too old and had apparently been assigned to this position after a falling out with Goering. Weidling immediately asked for his relief, and the next day a young paratrooper, Oberst Hermann, took over the division. The 9th Army's 101st Corps was to our right, and a 3rd Army Panzer Corps was to our left. Behind Silo Heights were some hills, and behind the hills were many lakes so we decided to use the hills as our next line of defence. 7 a.m. on April 18, 1945, heavy bombs fell close to our headquarters in the villa at Waldseversdorf and Herbergen, preparing a command post in a wood somewhat distant from there. On the same day, the Russians broke through to the north and south of us again. Weidling now committed Panzer Division Munchenberg on the right flank of the corps because Russian tanks had broken through in the Munchenberg area. On the other side of our front, the situation on the left flank of the 9th Parachute Division became more and more precarious. A breakthrough to the left became probable, and there was a danger that our corps would be encircled in the area around the lakes. The situation seemed to become more desperate almost hourly, and it was becoming increasingly more difficult to keep our spirits up. The 9th Army promised to transfer the 18th Panzer Division to our corps the next day, April 19. Early on April 19, I moved into the woods with the most essential staff personnel. Only a few bunkers were ready, but we wanted to be ready to work from there when it became impossible to remain at the villa. At first it was still very cold, but soon the sun came up and I could take off my fur-lined overcoat. At about 9am, Von Doffing arrived.
Then General Heinrichi, commander of Army Group Weichsel, of which we were part, arrived. He approved Wiedling's combat decisions and warned about the danger of the front breaking apart between the 9th Army and the 3rd Army. We expected the 18th Panzer Division to arrive during the day from the Stettin area and to be placed under our command. A short time after Heinrichi departed, General Busser arrived. He too approved our conduct of the fighting and told us that we might also get the SS Panzer Division Nordland under our command. The SS Division Nordland was a division of Norwegian, Swedish and Danish volunteers, except for a few German officers. In many of the occupied countries, volunteers were recruited for special divisions from among young men who agreed with Hitler's political philosophy. This was especially successful in the Scandinavian countries, because Hitler's philosophy of the superiority of the Nordic race appealed to them. During a short pause in combat on April 19, Reich Hitler youth leader Artur Axmann arrived at our corps headquarters. Axmann, who was in his early thirties, had lost an arm fighting the Russians in 1941. At his request, we briefed him on the situation, and then he offered us a battalion of Hitler youth for combat. Weidling did not want to accept at first because he did not want to put children into the fighting, but then he reluctantly, almost grimly, agreed to put the boys in a blocking position behind the front to protect the corps' northern flank against enemy forces breaking through there. Goebbels had also sent some Volkssturm civil defence battalions to us here, which he should not have done. He should have contacted us to find out where we wanted them sent. Then we received another high-ranking civilian visitor. Reich Foreign Minister von Ribbentrop appeared at our basement headquarters at Waldseversdorf. After being briefed on the situation, Von Ribbentrop asked permission to drive to one of our divisions, and Weidling directed him to Panzer Division Muncherberg. Von Ribbentrop appeared depressed, even somewhat confused. He wore an officer's leather overcoat without insignia, and a uniform hat with the big eagle of the diplomatic corps. It was out of line for him to be at, the front, it would not even have been appropriate for him to come to us just to learn the situation. This was not his job, and it had nothing to do with his job. If he had wanted to learn the situation at the front, he had only to ask the chief of the general staff of the army at Führer headquarters what was happening, what he could expect, how long we expected to hold, and so on. But he had no business at the headquarters of a corps that was actively engaged in combat. Sometime after his departure, I received a call from Panzer Division Muncherberg, informing us that von Ribbentrop had requested that he be allowed to accompany a combat reconnaissance patrol. I relayed that information to Weedling, who refused the request, pointing out quite logically that at Ribbentrop's age, and without infantry training or experience, and wearing a uniform that would have made him stand out as a very inviting target, he would certainly be killed on an infantry patrol. With that, von Ribbentrop departed from the division without returning to us. In the meantime, the Russian attacks continued undiminished, and we began to have difficulty maintaining contact between the 3rd and 9th Armies, as Heinrichi had predicted. Our 9th Parachute Division reported the final disruption of their contact with the 3rd Army's 101st Corps to the north. Then, after five days of massive attacks, the 2nd Russian Armoured Army succeeded in breaking through our front, threatening our left flank. Parts of the 18th Panzer Division began arriving, and, in desperation, we threw them into the battle piecemeal as they arrived. With that, we managed to stop the Russians on our left. On our right, Panzer Division Muncherberg was engaged in fierce fighting with Russian tank forces, and here we lost contact with our neighbouring corps on the right during the evening. To prevent our being outflanked on both sides and giving the Russians unimpeded access to Berlin, Weidling decided to fall back to the muncherberg waldseversdorf line, which we had determined would be our next main defence line. In places, however, the Russians had already breached the Waldseversdorf line, by 6 p.m. we could hear machine gun fire and mortar shells were exploding nearby. Therefore, we moved our corps headquarters to Colony Herrenhorst, a small community on a pine hill south of Strasbourg. By 8 p.m., we were again ready to conduct combat. The SS Division Nordland arrived during the night. In addition, the heavy anti aircraft units in the Strasbourg area were put under our command. Unfortunately, they had only immobile, pivoted 88mm guns but they could at least prevent a surprise tank attack into our deep flank. I drew up their orders for Weidling's signature and advised the anti-aircraft units of the combat situation. Our single corps was now facing an entire Russian army group, which they called a front.
If not an army group, we should have been at least an army instead of a corps. Obviously, we were not going to be able to hold out here any better than anywhere else, and would have to fall back to Berlin proper. Already the Russians were shelling the city, finally, in the early hours of April 20, I could close my eyes for a few hours. While drifting off to sleep, I thought of the stirring speech I had heard Goebbels make on the radio recently about new wonder weapons that would yet enable us to win the war. The endless slogans and propaganda coming from the government in Berlin sounded to us at the front like sheer childishness. Our headquarters then was in the home of a railroad employee who had been utterly believing as he listened to Goebbels. Although I could not tell him and his wife that the Russians would probably overrun their home within 36 hours, I advised them to send their 16-year-old daughter away. I was awakened by detonations of light shells all around. I decided that it was probably fire from tanks that were still a mile or so north of us. Our new main defence line was already in Russian hands in some places. Russian tanks and infantry had broken through to the right of us and were already southwest of our corps headquarters. We threw the SS Panzer Division Nordland against this enemy force, with orders to secure the corps' southern flank. We explored a new line of resistance toward the south in the lake area of Strasbourg. If we could secure all the land between the lakes in, this area before the Russians arrived, we could hope to make another stand there. If only Goebbels had sent his civil defence battalions here instead of where he had sent them. On the trip to Colony Herrenhorst, I learned that most of Goebbels's civil defence battalions had already been dispersed by air attacks. Only the remaining parts of the two battalions could be sent to the Strasbourg Lake area to help man the new defence line there. The frontal attacks against us decreased during the day, as the Russians now put everything available into exploiting the gaps on either side of our corps. The Hitler Youth Battalion that Weidling had been so reluctant to use had had its baptism of fire the night before in its position north of Waldseversdorf, attacked by Russian tanks. The leader of the battalion, a 19-year-old senior Hitler youth leader, had completely lost control at the very outset of combat. The crying of his wounded boys had deprived him of his nerve. Crying himself, he had ordered the position to be abandoned without making a report to the Corps or to anyone else. The boys were dispersed in all directions. Because of this, a very serious situation had arisen on our left flank. However, by dispatching anti-tank gunners of the 18th Armoured Infantry Division, we were able to close the gap that had resulted. In the afternoon, severe fighting developed about three kilometres north of our corps headquarters, between Russian tanks proceeding towards Strasbourg and our anti-aircraft emplacements. In spite of their courageous resistance and the destruction of many Russian tanks, the anti-aircraft crews could not stop the enemy in the long run, especially when infantry was dispatched against them. With that, facing the danger of being surrounded again, we ordered the front moved back to the lake line in the Strasbourg area. At 8pm, we moved our headquarters to Ellisenhof, about three kilometres south of Altlandsburg. On the way there, we observed intense enemy aircraft activity everywhere. Along the road from Altlandsburg, I could see burning houses as well as burning Russian tanks that had been stopped by anti-aircraft guns when they approached our positions from Altlandsburg. That village itself was in Russian hands, and Ellisenhof was only three kilometres from there, without any troops in between. Major Wolf immediately organised the local defence with the clerks and drivers as they arrived. I lay down for a while to get some rest, since communication lines had not yet been established and there was nothing I could do. Besides, it was clear that the Corps headquarters could not remain here, because with the loss of Altlandsburg, the position of the Corps in the narrows between the lakes was already outflanked again. By midnight on April 20, Weidling and von Doffing arrived from Colony Herrenhorst. They decided to move the headquarters again, to a location where we would have the protection of the divisions. The new headquarters was supposed to be in the southeastern part of Petershagen. Over country roads, dodging to the south since new enemy movements had been reported, I reached Petershagen. The inhabitants had mostly left. Only a few elderly people were in some of the basements. I found some individual houses that were suitable for our headquarters, and our communications people quickly established communications lines to our divisions. The lines were disrupted constantly by Russian artillery fire, however, and we had not had wire connection with the 9th Army Command for several hours.
At 7am on April 21, as I was eating some scrambled eggs, a radio message arrived from 9th Army Headquarters reading, and I expected resolute fighting from now on. Corps Headquarters is to be moved immediately to the east edge of Berlin. Apparently, 9th Army thought we were inside Berlin. I gave the message to Weidling, who became angry and had the following radio message sent to the 9th Army. Corps headquarters is engaged in infantry fighting five kilometres east of the edge of Berlin. From the divisions came reports that the frontal attacks of the Russians were becoming stronger again, and we had to dispatch our last reserves. In some places the enemy already had broken through the narrows between the lakes, or had unexpectedly crossed the lakes in boats. That meant that now we had no other choice than to put all troops able to fight into the direct defence of Berlin, although there too break-ins had already occurred in the north, near Altlandsberg. In Kopernik on that day, I witnessed a truck loaded with bread and stopped because of traffic, being looted by passing women, children and old men. The driver stood there, unable to do anything about it except make parrying gestures. His truck was emptied within a few minutes. The eastern Berlin suburbs of Friedrichsfelder, Karlsdorf Sud and Karlshorst were already under constant fire from light artillery, probably from the direction of Altlandsberg. Our corps headquarters had been established in the meantime in some villas at the south edge of Karlsdorf Sud. With our right flank at Mughal Lake, we intended to try to hold a line connecting Leopergarten, Karlsdorf and Marzahn. There we should be connected with the Berlin defence line, to the left, however, we would not have any connection with the 11th SS Panzer Corps. From the 9th Army we asked permission to close this gap. In response we got orders to leave the north bank of the Spree River, connect at our left to the Berlin defence line at the Treptow Park, and prolong the right flank along the Spree River to the southeast to gain contact with the 9th Army again. For this night it was too late to make these movements. The orders were issued to the divisions for execution during the next night. For the remainder of the night I could sleep on a bed for about three hours. I was awakened in the small hours of April 22, 1945, by the fire of light artillery and mortars in the surrounding area. I went to the air raid shelter of the Children's and Senior Citizens Institution next door, where our headquarters had been prepared in the meantime. Three or four rooms had been emptied for us there. The other, larger rooms were occupied by forty or fifty children and fifteen to twenty nurses. Outside it was becoming more and more dangerous because Russian tanks that had broken through at Kopernik were driving around nearby. German tank hunter groups with bazooka-like panzerfausts were chasing them, and the tanks were shooting wildly in all directions. All divisions reported new Russian attacks with tank support. The Russian pressure was especially strong on the right flank, where the advance had been stopped successfully before the Spree River. In the north, the Russians marched into a wide gap that occurred at Verneuken, toward the west. On the morning of April 22, we moved our headquarters to Rudo, seven kilometres southwest of Kopernik. I was to stay at the old headquarters until 9pm and then follow after all our divisions had reported. During the day, I could hear the sounds of infantry fighting coming closer and closer. It appeared as if the children's home would be in Russian hands by the time I was to leave at 9pm. I posted guards, so I would at least get a warning in time to escape capture. One after another, the divisions reported abandoning their present headquarters. At about 8 p.m., the operations officer of the 9th Parachute Division and my general staff college classmate, Major Engel, appeared. He had been my closest friend at the general staff college. We talked about the situation that he was reporting to me, and I was reporting to the 9th Army. The fight was obviously hopeless, and we could not understand why the government did not sue for peace and stop the senseless slaughter. Slogans and propaganda were not going to throw the Soviets out of Germany, at the most optimistic, we could continue to resist a couple more weeks. We had not, during the entire war, had the kind of firepower the Russians were now unleashing against us on one small front, and what was happening to our troops was inhuman. They were now fighting with little more than determination, desperation and raw courage. I recalled the name many were now sarcastically used for Hitler. Grofars, Groster Feldherr aller Zeiten, the greatest general of all time. Engel and I discussed the situation as personal friends rather than as corps and division operations officers. I gave him the picture of the overall situation as it looked according to our information. In the West, the Western Allies were at the Elbe River, 
with a few small bridgeheads on the east side of the river, but they had stopped there without carrying out an attack farther to the east. This had stunned us, because we had fought so fiercely against the Russians in the hope that we could hold them off until the Western forces arrived to take Berlin. Now it seemed obvious that they had no interest in taking Berlin to keep the Russians out. The Russians had torn open the front of the 4th Panzer Army of Army Group Shorna near Guben and Forst and were marching behind us. We had to deal with a breakthrough between the 9th and 3rd Armies through which motorised Russian infantry were streaming toward the west without resistance, passing by Berlin. Unimpeded traffic out of Berlin would probably be possible for only a short time. For a brief moment, Engels and I discussed getting into my car and leaving this witch's cauldron. The end had to come with the encirclement of Berlin by the Russians, to stay meant Russian captivity or death. If we escaped to the west, it would mean freedom, or in the worst case British or American captivity, which was not too disturbing. But it also meant abandoning those men who were still fighting so desperately, and neither of us could bear the thought of deserting such brave men. We decided to stay and do our duty to the end. There was no question that, with the red stripes on our trousers and the Corps flag on my car, we would have made it through all the roadblocks and controls. No one in our respective staffs would have questioned our disappearance. They would have assumed that we had not been able to get away from our old headquarters and had been killed or captured. But our pride and sense of duty would not let us do it, at 9pm, after the last division had reported, I got into my Kubelwagen. Combat activity had quieted down somewhat. The nurses wanted desperately to go. With me, many others and some of the children had left earlier, with our other cars. The poor, hapless women, having heard many stories of sexual assault and wanton killing when the Russians took a place, were terrified of the Russian soldiers. I could take only one of them, however, because several members of my staff had to go and there was room for no more in the car. With an aching heart, I could only leave all of them but one to their fate. I left it to them to decide which one would leave with me. I have no idea how they decided, but at the appointed time, one of them appeared, in Oberschoneweide, we had to drive through continuous artillery fire, now including heavy artillery. It was a feeling akin to terror, with heavy artillery shells exploding all around us, and roof tiles, window frames and chunks of street pavement flying through the air. It seemed as if the whole world were exploding around us. Artillery fire in a city is much more frightening than it is in the open. Whenever a shell hit something above us and exploded there, it sprayed shrapnel and fragments of whatever it hit all over. I was glad when we had the bridge over the Spree River behind us, because it was probably the target of all the Russian artillery fire, and beginning in one hour, two of our divisions had to cross this bridge. When I arrived in Rudo, there was great excitement in the basement of the large school building where our headquarters was located. South and west of Rudo, Russian tanks and armoured vehicles with motorised infantry had appeared in several villages. Major Wolf again had to organise sentinels in the immediate vicinity of the corps headquarters. Although these enemy troops were clearly reconnaissance forces that would have retreated at the slightest resistance, it could have become very unpleasant if suddenly three armoured cars had appeared in the courtyard of our school. The withdrawal movements of our divisions from their positions had already started. Because of the exact timing of the marching orders and well-prepared traffic control, the movement of our four divisions away from the enemy over two bridges began rather well during the night of April 22. The SS Division Nordland, which now stood at the left flank and would be free first, was to form a reduced bridgehead around Oberschoneweide to protect the retreating parts of the other divisions. The division commander, SS General Major Ziegler, objected when he got this order, because he thought Weidling intended to sacrifice his division to save the other divisions. Only an outburst by Weidling made him accept his task. This incident indicated that discipline was beginning to break down. Earlier, Ziegler would not have questioned such an order, but after a short rest, I began to receive the first reports. Without heavy losses, the disengagement from the front had been successful. It was now April 23, 1945, and the bridgehead to Oberschoneweide was still in our hand. In Kopernik, however, something had gone terribly wrong. Our 20th Division was supposed to hold Kopernik so we would have a stable front from there on south of the Spree River, but the division could not hold, and Kopernik was overrun.
Of course, the division was to blow up the bridge across the Spree if it had to retreat, but the Russians struck with such overpowering force that the Spree bridge was not completely blown up and was still usable. This gave the Russians a bridge over, which they could bring tanks, so Weidling issued orders to the division commander to retake that bridge and finish blowing it up. The division commander, Oberst Scholzer, to everyone's shock, replied that his division was exhausted and decimated and unable to mount the ordered attack. Weidling was naturally infuriated that a division commander would refuse his order, and he exploded. Since I was at hand, and he knew I had been trained at the General Staff College to lead a division in combat, and that I would carry out the order he ordered me to go to Kopenick, take command of that division, lead the attack, and blow up the bridge. The idea of a major leading a division was preposterous, but he had no one else to send. He could not spare von Duffing, who substituted for him at corps headquarters in his absence, and he knew I could and would do the job. That would have probably made me, at 28, the youngest and lowest-ranking division commander in the history of the German army. Kopernik was about six kilometres away in a straight line, but I had to take a circuitous route to avoid the fighting. My mind was in a turmoil during the trip because I knew that the division commander I was to relieve was a good man with an excellent combat record, which would now be ruined by a court-martial. But I knew Widling, and I knew he could blow up like that, of course, he could not tolerate a division commander's refusing an order, and it was in fact an order that simply had to be carried out. It would have been very bad for the Ninth Army if the Russians held that bridge and got their tanks across the Spree River. When I arrived, I talked first to the division's operations officer, an Oberstleutnant in General Stabwey learned from him that just before Oberst Scholzer had received Weidling's order, he had learned that his wife and children at home had been killed in a bombing raid. He had just lost control of himself for a while, which was understandable to me, but Weidling had no tolerance for such weakness. I am sure that if it had happened to him, it would have hit him as hard personally, but he would not have let it interfere with his duties. The operations officer told me now that Scholzer had regained control of himself and ordered the attack on the bridge. Under those circumstances, I discreetly withdrew and returned to corps headquarters, where I informed General Weidling of the changed circumstances. I took a chance by returning, because that meant that I was not carrying out his orders either. Since the attack was being made, however, Weidling was content. The bridge was recaptured and blown up, but with heavy losses. In the meantime, alarming news came from the 18th Panzer Division regarding enemy pressure across the Spree River. Weidling and I drove to Altglienica, to the headquarters of the 18th Panzer Division, Weidling wanted to see the situation personally. The community was under uninterrupted artillery fire. Enemy infantry attacks came out of the southern part of Kopernik and from the east, where the Russians, who were already crossing the river with ferries, had been stopped until now. Anti-aircraft guns, unfortunately immobile, were there, and could be used against Russian tanks. The division commander, General Major Rauch, believed he could hold until evening. To the south, he had only weak defensive positions along the Spree River, where the Russians had not yet attacked. We had to move our corps headquarters into the outskirts of Berlin regardless of anything else, so I set out in search of a location. In spite of our efforts, we still knew nothing about the position of the Berlin defence line. I had to make contact, therefore, as quickly as possible with some local command post. But first we had to have new headquarters, because infantry fire was becoming heavier and heavier. At about 9am, riding in a Kubelwagen and under mortar fire, I managed to get into Berlin on an autobahn. When I arrived at Schoenike, a suburb of Berlin that we had tentatively selected as our next headquarters, it was apparent that here too it would be impossible for our staff to work because Russian infantry was already moving along the subway tracks from Erkner and Kopernik. Deciding that the subway station at Ransdorf would be the best location for our new headquarters, I telephoned von Duving to come there. When he arrived, he approved my decision and began to supervise the installation of the Corps' headquarters. Now I finally could go try to make contact with those in charge of the defence of Berlin. We had to find these people, and try to coordinate their defence with ours. We knew only that something had been prepared, although we guessed that whatever had been prepared would be manned by Hitler Youth and by Volkssturm rather than by soldiers. I was shocked when I found the prepared defence ring around Berlin. It was empty foxholes and trenches and roadblock completely unmanned. Disgustedly, 
I realized that it was no more than a line on a map. It had been Goebbels's responsibility as Defence Commissar for Berlin to prepare these defences, but it was painfully obvious that he had no idea how to do it. So much for Goebbels's ability to assume military responsibility. I managed to get maps of what were supposed to be the defence lines around Berlin, so we could plan where to put our divisions when it came to that. All I found was a command post and a headquarters with several officers who were amputees. They commanded no troops, and some of them did not even know where the prepared defences were. Incompetence seemed to be the order of the day in Berlin. So Berlin was without defences, and light, fast Russian units were floating in between our corps, as the northernmost corps of the 9th Army and the southernmost corps of the 3rd Army. If either of the two corps had had reserves, Either could have repaired the situation, but neither of us had reserves, and the best we could hope for was to slow the Russians down a day or two. When I returned to our headquarters, a radio message from General Busa had arrived. We did not have wire connections that we were to protect the left flank of the 9th Army, at a line from Konigs Wusterhausen to Rangsdorf, about 20 kilometres south of Berlin, with our front facing north. That meant giving up Berlin so we would leave the city to its own fate, which, with the inadequate forces available for its defence, would mean the end for Berlin within a few days. This order indicated that General Busa was now thinking only of the Ninth Army, and that he probably intended to break through to the west to surrender there. His decision was a logical one, because trying to defend the city with over a million civilians still in it would result in senseless casualties. For us as well, this was a much more comfortable prospect than going into Berlin, which was little more than a heap of rubble to conduct a hopeless fight there. We had been thrown into Berlin without anticipating it, or having a chance to prepare for it, having been pushed back from the Oder River in less than a week by the most prodigious offensive of the war. During their massive attack, the Russians kept breaking through on each side of us, and we kept falling back to keep from being encircled. Their continued attempts to encircle us eventually cut our corps off from General Buse and the Ninth Army to our south. We finally lost all contact with them and did not know what the situation was. We could see Russian light tanks and trucks to our south between us and the Ninth Army. General Weidling initiated the actions necessary to comply with General Buse's order to form an east-west front that faced north. Then he turned to me. Knapper, you know Berlin from your time at Kriegsschule Potsdam, he said. Let's go see General Krebs, Chief of the General Staff of the Army at Führer Headquarters, and see whether we can establish communication with the Ninth Army from there and find out what the overall situation is. Von Duffing stayed at Corps Headquarters to run things in Weidling's absence, which is the primary function of a Chief of Staff, and Weidling and I left for the Reich Chancellery. We took one car and driver and two motorcycle runners. The city was under fire from heavy artillery, which was probably mounted on a railroad car somewhere 30 or more kilometres away, and there was also some bombing by Russian aircraft. Fortunately, the artillery was not concentrated. It was scattered all over the city, with a heavy artillery shell landing somewhere in the city every few minutes. Smoke and dust covered the city. Streetcars were standing disabled in the streets, their electric wires dangling. In the eastern suburbs, many buildings were burning, and the civilian population was queuing up in breadlines and in line to get water from any source that was still working. Civilians were everywhere, scurrying from cover to cover because of the artillery shells and bombs. To avoid creating a possible panic, Goebbels had refused to issue orders for civilians to leave the city, even women and children, and now thousands more were fleeing into Berlin from the east. Defending Berlin was obviously going to be very ugly business and many civilians were going to die in the fighting. Arriving at the Reich Chancellery at about 6pm, we left our car and driver to proceed on foot, taking the motorcycle runners with us. The area around the Reich Chancellery was pitted with deep craters, fallen trees were scattered about like matchsticks, and the sidewalks were blocked by piles of rubble. The Reich Chancellery was badly damaged, with only shells of walls remaining in some places, the entrance hall on the Wilhelmstrasse had been completely destroyed. The only part of the Reich Chancellery that was still usable was the underground bunker system. In the underground garage, we saw several Mercedes-Benzes we had seen Hitler use in parades and political rallies. 
There was an entrance to the passage to Führer headquarters in the underground bunker from the garage. SS guards at the entrance saluted Weidling with his knight's cross and swords. These first guards were SS Unterscharführer, but the deeper we went toward the bunker, the higher the rank of the guards became. The bunker system under the Reich Chancellery had become a virtual underground city, housing hundreds of people, including civilians. Many of the civilians probably were employees who worked there and now no longer tried to go home at night. Others probably worked in the surrounding government buildings and found this the safest place to be now. The population of the bunker was controlled, of course, but it was shelter for many people. It was badly overcrowded because it had been built as an air raid shelter, not as a place for hundreds of people to live. There were also many wounded soldiers, apparently from SS Brigada Führer Monka's SS unit assigned to defend the bunker. Some were on mattresses on the floor and others just sat around. Führer headquarters was about three levels down from the garage. We were stopped at many guard posts, even though Weidling was a general with many impressive military decorations, and we were searched by the guards before being admitted to the actual Führer bunker. The SS guards were respectful, but here we were carefully investigated as to who we were, where we came from, and what our business was. We had to show proper identification and surrender our pistols. Then we finally entered the antechamber to the offices of the Chief of the General Staff of the Army, General Krebs, and the Chief of the Personnel Department of the Army, General Bergdorf. We were announced, and Bergdorf's adjutant, Oberstleutnant Weiss, came to welcome us. He led us to the next room where both Krebs and Bergdorf awaited us. The reception General Weidling received from Krebs and Bergdorf seemed reserved and strange, considering that he had known them both for years and had attended the General Staff College with Krebs. They invited us to be seated and had ham sandwiches and a bottle of Hennessy cognac brought in for us. At higher staffs, this kind of hospitality was standard procedure for visitors from the front. They had talked to us only briefly when Krebs said he would announce Weidling's presence to Hitler and see if Hitler wanted to talk to him. That was surprising, since Weidling had not come to see Hitler and knew of no reason Hitler would want to talk to him. When Krebs and Bergdorf were out of the room, Weidling said quietly, Something is wrong. They are behaving strangely. After about ten minutes, Bergdorf returned and told Weidling that Hitler wanted to see him. I stayed behind, of course, and talked to Weiss, Freitag Luringhoff, and Bolt, Bergdorf's and Krebs's aides. They wanted to know what was happening where we were. Weidling had filled Krebs in on that briefly, and also had told him about the order we had received from Busser to form an east-west line 20 kilometres south of Berlin. I got information from them about the big picture, which was what we had come for. They told me that the Western Allies had stopped at the Elbe River, and that General Wenck's 12th Army was getting ready to relieve Berlin. They were optimistic, and I did not attempt to discourage their optimism, even though I was certain that Wenck could not relieve Berlin. After Weidling, Krebs and Bergdorf had been gone about 20 minutes, Krebs and Bergdorf returned. They offered me cognac and Krebs began to question me about our situation at the front. After about twenty more minutes, Weidling returned and told me that Hitler had ordered us to come into Berlin and take over the eastern and southern fronts of the city, and that we had to get in touch with von Duffing and stop him from carrying out Busser's order. Using Krebs's telephone, I talked to a civilian telephone operator who got me through to our corps headquarters. I told von Duffing briefly what was going on, and then Weidling gave him orders to stop the north-south movement and prepare for our divisions to come into Berlin instead. We planned to establish our headquarters at Tempelhof Airport. When Weidling and I were alone again, Weidling exploded. What animals Krebs and Bergdorf are, he said. They did not warn me that Hitler was threatening to have me shot because of a report that we were abandoning Berlin and escaping to the west. Hitler greeted me with the words, Weidling. I will have you shot, and on top of that false report, Hitler had also learned that we were swinging around to form an east-west line and leave Berlin open to the Russians, but he did not know that Weidling was acting on General Busser's orders. When Hitler had shouted himself out and Weidling could finally get a word in, he corrected Hitler's inaccurate information. After Weidling's complete report, Hitler calmed down and became friendly and finally ordered us into Berlin to defend the east and south fronts.
What a difference between the haphazard way things were being done now and the professional way things had been done in the 1940 and 1941. While I talked to von Duffing on the telephone about the details of the move into Berlin, Weidling flushed down his anger against Krebs and Bergdorf with cognac. I had two more to try to help empty the bottle, since Weidling seemed determined to finish it off by himself. He was furious that Krebs and Bergdorf had not warned him of the situation. They parted in anger, and the cognac did not help the situation. In addition to everything else, Weidling was also angry because we were now trapped in Berlin which guaranteed that we would eventually be captured by the Russians instead of being able to escape to the west with the Ninth Army. And finally, at 9pm, I got Weidling to leave Führer headquarters. We had a lot to do this night. Weidling wanted to inform the defence sector commanders on the east and south sides of Berlin that our divisions would be taking over from them and that they should pass on to the division commanders their knowledge of the area. Weidling could hide the fact that he was drunk only with a great effort as we set out to visit the defence sector commanders. Our first stop was at Tempelhof Sector D. An old exhumed Air Force General Major named Schroeder was in charge here. He had no concept of infantry fighting, which resulted in his being chewed out by the inebriated Weidling. To appease Weidling, he offered us the use of the basement of his building as our headquarters. I got on his telephone and ordered our advance group to this location to set up new core staff headquarters. Then Weidling and I went to Hasenheide. There an infantry oberst who had lost an arm was in charge. The man was asleep when we arrived, and we had to wait for him to get dressed. Weidling, impatient from too much cognac and still angry about his experience at Führer headquarters, began to berate the unfortunate man, because he did not get dressed quickly enough and kept Weidling waiting. He was completely unreasonable with this poor man, who also began to get angry because he had done nothing wrong and had only one hand with which to dress, and it was obvious to him that Weidling was drunk. I intervened in the argument and eventually succeeded in getting them both quieted down. I then suggested to Weidling that he stay at our new headquarters at Tempelhof and turn in. I could visit the other sector commanders, he agreed, and I went on alone. Even though the sectors were not far apart, the trip was a harrowing one in the dark. With all the obstacles in the streets, we had only little slits for headlights. At all the sectors I visited, I found unfront-like conditions. Much had to be done here if we really wanted to put up a fight against the Russians. We had five experienced division staffs, however, and we had to make them the skeleton of a fighting force that we would flesh out with the inexperienced personnel. The date was April 24, and it was on this night that the apocalyptic battle for the city of Berlin began in earnest. The next day, Russian assault troops fought their way into the suburbs of the city. For the next eight days, Berlin was to be one huge urban killing ground. Then I returned to our new headquarters at Tempelhof Airport. The drive through Berlin at night revealed spectacular and gruesome images of the burning city. The glare from flaming buildings silhouetted the gutted hulls of other buildings. In a basement passage of our new headquarters, I found a spot amid civilians who were sleeping there and lay down to close my eyes for a few hours. In the morning, our staff arrived and the work began, producing orders to the divisions and to the sector commanders. We set up our headquarters and established communication with the divisions through the civilian telephone network. Our headquarters was a beautifully furnished former command post for an air raid protection unit. There was no shortage of good office furniture, radios and other luxury items, and when I saw all the luxuries that the army had squirrelled away, I grimly remembered watching the civilians looting a bread truck for food. The divisions went into their assigned positions. Then, at 11am, we received a call from Führer headquarters that Hitler wanted to see Weidling again. He wanted to know whether our move had been executed successfully, I did not accompany Weidling this time because I was busy with the divisions. Hitler ordered Weidling to assume command of the defence of the entire city, instead of just the east and south, by taking over the Berlin military command in addition to our divisions. In this position, Weidling was replacing Oberst Kather, who had just been promoted the day before to General Lieutenant for the duration of his position. Weidling was the fifth commander to occupy this position in the last few months because of clashes the other commanders had had with Goebbels.
Weidling, therefore, had made one very astute condition that he must be in sole command of the defence of Berlin, without any interference from Goebbels, the southeast of the city, I witnessed an event that said everything about the state to which Germany had been reduced. Water pipes in the city had been ruptured by the bombing and the shelling, and people had to stand in lines for hours for water at the few sources still available. The food problem was even worse. Some storage houses had been destroyed by bombing and shelling, and the others had been plundered by civilians. I was in a cable wagon, and the part of the city I was driving through was under continuous artillery fire. In spite of the artillery bombardment, civilians, mostly women, were queuing in front of the food stores and water spigots. Just as we were about to drive past such a line, an artillery shell exploded beside the line of women. As the smoke began to clear, I could see that many of the women had been hit. Those women who were unhurt carried the dead, the dying and the wounded into the entrances of nearby buildings and cared for them, and then again formed their queues so they would not lose their places in line. This was the sector commander I was visiting during this trip, had his headquarters in the basement of a brewery. The entire sector staff consisted of amputees, but that at least meant they had combat experience. They all were very confident, still believing in Goebbels's speeches, which was amazing under the circumstances. They even interpreted our taking over of their command as a positive sign. I had the adjutant of the sector brief me on the situation in his sector, and learned that they did not see even the most obvious things, in spite of their front experience. They should have known that the few civil defence units, old men and young boys, could not stop the Russian tanks, and if those tanks turned around at the first indication of resistance, it was by no means a sign of victory by the civil defence or of the Hitler youth. It only meant that it was a reconnaissance unit that was not supposed to fight, but to find out what was opposing them. We received news that SS Group Steiner, which was supposed to break through to Berlin from Oranienburg, had been repulsed and driven back to its initial positions. The offensive of Wenck's 12th Army was supposed to have begun from the area of Wittenberg, but it had not begun to have any impact yet. Early in the morning on April 25, Weidling and I drove to the Berlin Military Command at Hohenzollern Damm in Wilmersdorf, a southwestern suburb of Berlin about five kilometres from the Reich Chancellery. The Berlin Military Command was just like a corps staff, it was a big operation, with a peacetime staff of about 300, including many telephone operators, now mostly women. When we took over, therefore, all our positions existed in duplicate. The Berlin Military Command's Chief of Staff was Oberstleutnant im Generalstab Refior, an old acquaintance of General Weidling's. Weidling decided to keep both Chiefs of Staff, von Duffing for fighting and tactical matters, and Refior, who knew everyone in both the political and military command structures in Berlin, and knew how to get things done for political matters. The Berlin Military Command's operations officer, Major im Generalstab Sprotter, made a bad first impression on Weidling, who dispatched him to Potsdam. Sprotter, not in the least disappointed, was in a big hurry to get out of Berlin anyway. To turn everything over to me in an orderly manner would have taken several days, so he showed me his maps and drawings with a sweep of his hand, and promptly disappeared. With that, I was sitting alone in a room with three telephones that rang constantly. When I realised after three phone calls that they were all from offices of city, party or ministry authorities who were calling to get information about the military situation, I took all three phones off the hook so I could get my work done. We had to act quickly now to distribute our five division staffs in such a way that each of them got two to four defence sectors, so we would have all around the city a firm skeleton of experienced combat officers whom we knew and who knew us. Then, as quickly as possible, we had to establish a secure military communications network. It was impossible to continue to lead our troops via the public telephone network. Life here now became like a typical day in combat. Constant crises. When I could sleep two hours in a row, I was lucky, in addition to all the crises, I had to coordinate all the reports from the field. They would come to me by telephone, and I had to prepare a daily report at night that summarised all the telephone reports I had received during the day. Since the artillery shelling and the bombing strikes were becoming more and more frequent, 
We moved into the basement shortly after we moved into this building. Again, we found some of the rooms to be filled with food, coffee, liquor, even wristwatches. All military personnel in Berlin, except the SS troops that guarded Führer headquarters under SS General Monke, were now under Weidling's command, the Army, the Hitler Youth, the Volkssturm, the anti-aircraft crews, the convalescent battalions from hospitals and so forth. We had our own four divisions. The 5th one, the 20th SS Panzer Grenadier Division, had disappeared to the west, apparently to surrender there. In its sector, each division took command of whatever Hitler Youth and Volkssturm happened to be there. After a day or so, we had a defence that could hope to resist the Russians at least for a little while. We did not have long to wait. The disappearance of the 20th SS Panzer Grenadier Division left a gap, and the Russians soon drove a wedge through it. By now, we could see the infantry fighting from our building. During the evening, I entered a room where Weidling was meeting with both von Duving and Refur. They were discussing whether to defend Berlin dutifully, or whether it would be appropriate to stay here and let the Russians pass by on both sides of us, and then break through the Grunewald, woods to the west of the city, escape to the west, and surrender to the Western Allies. If we stayed to defend Berlin, it would be necessary to move our headquarters to the centre of the city, because within two days at the latest the Russians would be occupying this building. Weidling then made his decision to stay and defend Berlin. The night was extremely turbulent. Outside we could hear the sounds of combat nearby. Major Wolf and his counterpart on the Berlin military command staff, Hauptmann Burenbeck, had organised the immediate defence of the building. I returned early in the morning of April 26 to the second floor office I had occupied before we moved into the basement. There were continuous artillery bursts all around, and I could see hand-to-hand -hand fighting in the garden parcels to the south. We were obviously in a very dangerous position. Weidling decided to move Corps headquarters to a big anti-aircraft bunker near the Berlin Zoo. I was quite glad to be ordered to go to the air raid shelter bunker at the zoo with Major Wolf as an advance party to establish our new headquarters. Major Wolf and I made our way to the zoo bunker separately to try to ensure that one of us would get there. The zoo bunker, a heavily fortified place with heavy anti-aircraft guns on the roof, would be safe against bombing and artillery. I was accompanied by a driver and a motorcycle runner, and when we left our headquarters we had to be careful, because the railroad embankment behind our building was under fire, and we had to cross it to get to our cable wagon and motorcycle. We crossed it by dashing from cover to cover, finally arriving safely at our vehicles. As we drove through the city, the earth trembled with each exploding artillery shell, and a huge geyser of earth and debris erupted from the ground with each explosion. The noise was deafening, and the heaving of the earth was unsettling. A sliver of shrapnel from an exploding artillery shell finally punctured one of the tyres on my cable wagon. While my driver was changing the tyre, a woman watching from a house nearby offered me a cup of tea. She was about forty-five years old and matronly, with worn clothes, bedraggled hair, and a kind face. She was the wife of a Feldwebel and the mother of a Gefreiter, and she had no idea what had happened to either of them. Apparently, my lack of personal care showed, and she asked if I would like to wash up as well, so after several days I was able to experience the luxury of washing. I greatly appreciated her generosity, especially since many civilians were understandably beginning to turn against the army for defending the city instead of surrendering it. Her apartment was in shambles from the artillery blasts, small knick-knacks, little pieces of her life, lay shattered on the floor about her. When will the Russians arrive, Herr Major? She asked in a matter of hours, I told her honestly. A day at most you will be safest if you stay in your basement. Parts of Berlin were a virtual junkyard of disabled military equipment, and the smell of death now permeated everything. In addition to human corpses, many of the animals from the zoo had escaped and been killed. I arrived at the zoo bunker at about noon, and found that Wolf had already arrived. There was a big flak bunker at the zoo, seven or eight storeys high, with six big 128mm and six 20mm anti-aircraft guns on its roof. The bunker could house 600 people. Every room was occupied. So we selected those we would need and told their occupants they would have to leave because the rooms were needed by the commanding general of the Berlin Military Command. Several of the rooms had been reserved as a private refuge for Goebbels, 
because the place was so safe from attack. I did not attempt to dispossess Goebbels, of course, but I took over the offices of other superfluous staffs. I sent Major Wolf back with the information that rooms had been assigned and that the communications officer should come to see to the appropriate telephone connections. After Wolf had gone, I put up signs directing the various units of our core staff to their assigned rooms. When I had done everything I could do, it was late at night and I lay down to rest, having had very little rest or sleep in a long time. Every half hour or so a bomb would hit the building. The building would sway visibly, the lights would flicker out momentarily, and a fine spray of plaster would descend from the ceiling. But the building was completely safe because the walls were several metres thick and bombs could not penetrate them. In my state of exhaustion, the motion of the giant bunker swaying on the marshy soil of the Tiergarten Park only helped put me to sleep. When I woke after a few hours and the staff had still not arrived, I began to wonder if perhaps they had decided to leave through the Grunewald after all. Since I could not reach anyone by telephone, I decided to take advantage of the situation and get a full night's sleep for a change. There was nothing I could do anyway. Finally, the next morning, Wolf returned with the news that Weidling had decided to move instead to the old headquarters of the Supreme Command of the Armed Forces. It was closer to Führer headquarters, and it had direct telephone lines to it because it was located on Bendlerstrasse. Everyone in the army referred to it as Bendlerstrasse. It had been a full city block of buildings, but everything except the basements had by now been pretty much destroyed. In the centre of the huge courtyard was a large bunker, three or four storeys high, which was safe against the most formidable bombs, just like the zoo bunker. It was used as the communication centre not only for the army in Berlin, but also for Führer headquarters. When I arrived there, our staff had been established in the basement. The actual working headquarters of the Supreme Command of the Armed Forces was no longer in Berlin. It had moved out of Berlin when the Allies began to bomb the city on a regular basis. By the time we moved in, the place had been almost abandoned except for civilians living in the basements. Our staff had already been at work there since midnight. I found Refia at his desk with coffee, cognac, asparagus tips and ham. Von Doffing was working on a plan to break out of Berlin to the northwest, across the Pickelsdorf Bridge. I joined him and helped put together the time calculations and the distribution of our forces. I also drew the necessary maps for the operation. General Weidling was in a room in which we were told Count von Stauffenberg and some other officers had been shot following the July 20, 1944, attempt to assassinate Hitler. It was chilling to see the bullet holes in the wall. It occurred to me that Germany would probably not be enduring this terrible final battle if von Stauffenberg had succeeded. At noon, I had to leave to take the city map with the current military situation to Führer headquarters. It had become very dangerous outside, with shell bursts everywhere, the acrid smell of smoke mingled with the stench of decomposing corpses. Dust from pulverised bricks and plaster rose over the city like a heavy fog. The streets, littered with rubble and pockmarked with huge craters, were deserted. I had to be careful not to get entangled in the streetcar wires dangling everywhere. At the Reich Chancellery, my identification card, signed by Goebbels personally so I could get quick access to the bunker, secured entrance for me. To get to the actual Führer headquarters, I had to show another identification card signed by Johann Meyer, army adjutant to Hitler. Then I had to surrender my pistol, and finally I was admitted to the antechamber, which was furnished with green leather chairs along the walls. Such fine furniture seemed out of place in a concrete bunker deep under the ground. I thought I remembered the green chairs from my visit at the Chancellery six years earlier. Martin Bormann, who was sitting in the antechamber, immediately jumped at me and asked what I wanted. I told him I was bringing the latest situation map. I wanted to go to Krebs immediately, but Bormann insisted that I have soda and cookies while he pumped me with a lot of questions concerning the situation outside and what I thought about it. Bormann was about fifty years old, short and heavy, with a broad nose punctuating a round face that sat atop a bull neck. As political chief of staff to the Führer, he determined who was and was not admitted to see Hitler. In Krebs's antechamber, I met Weiss and Freytag Luringhof, aides to General Bergdorf, and gave them the situation map. In turn, I copied the overall situation from their map. According to it, Wenck's 12th Army had begun its attack on it, 
April 25 and had progressed well in the beginning. Today, however, Venk had been able to proceed no farther than the Belitz State Hospital and was engaged in heavy fighting with Soviet troops who had attacked it from the east. Nobody here in the map room of the Chief of Staff of the Army really believed any longer that Berlin would be relieved. I learned when I returned to our bunker that Goering had been arrested for attempting to replace Hitler as Führer, and that Hitler had ordered Himmler's arrest for attempting to negotiate with the Allies. The government was disintegrating as rapidly as the military situation, but Hitler was apparently determined to fight to the last possible moment, no matter how many lives it cost or how much destruction to the city. Interestingly, the Reich Chancellery did not have a large radio transmitter. All messages had to go through our communications centre in the bunker of the old headquarters of the Supreme Command of the Armed Forces, so we knew what was happening everywhere. From Führer headquarters, only a telephone connection of the public telephone network existed, and it was now being interrupted constantly by the fighting. We had laid four military cables to Vossstrasse, where the Reich Chancellery was located, of which only one was still occasionally operational, even though we had men working constantly to keep the lines in service. For that reason, I always had to make the trip myself whenever something important came up. The trip was becoming increasingly dangerous, because at some places Russian shock troops had already crossed the Landwehr Canal and were located in some of the houses at Matthias Churchyard and in the vicinity of the Hotel Esplanade. All the buildings in this area had basements and people were living in them. There was food in the buildings. Many things had been stored in these buildings because this had been the headquarters of the Supreme Command of the Armed Forces. There was even cognac and other things that were very scarce for civilians the army had obviously prepared to take care of itself. During the day, either von Duffing or I stayed in close contact with our divisions by telephone or radio, and of course each night I prepared a consolidated report from the division's reports. In addition, I made at least one daily trip to Führer headquarters to report, not only because our lines were constantly being destroyed by artillery fire, but because we could never be sure that the Russians were not listening in. One of the worst things about the defence of Berlin was that the Russians always had fresh reserves to put into the fighting, so they could rest their troops, but our people had to just keep fighting, hour after hour and day after day, until they were killed or seriously wounded. There was no such thing as a typical day. Sometimes the Russians would hit us at three in the morning, sometimes at six, and the day just unfolded from there. Our time was spent responding to crises that incessantly occurred, I would get reports from the divisions. I would get cries for help. I was constantly involved, solving logistical problems, receiving and compiling reports, and informing the divisions of new developments. General Weidling was always out visiting the divisions, going where things were worst to get his own view of each situation in person, and von Duffing was directing the fighting from corps headquarters. We all caught a few moments rest whenever work permitted, I learned that I had to stand up whenever I was wakened to take a telephone call. Several times I took a call that woke me, listened to the problem of the caller, gave instructions to handle the situation, and then went back to sleep. Then, when I woke, I had no recollection of the conversation and did not know I had given such orders, although eventually I would remember it. After that, I put the telephone far enough away that I would have to stand up to answer it. I had to report the decisions I made to the Chief of Staff and to the Commanding General, so it was essential that I remember what I had done. I spent a lot of my time now going back and forth between Führer headquarters and our corps headquarters on Bendlerstrasse. There were hardly any buildings remaining in the neighbourhood, and even those that still stood were badly damaged and nearly unrecognisable, although most of the basements were still usable. The whole area was in ruins, having been bombed earlier in British and American air raids and now shelled by Russian artillery. Artillery shells exploded continuously, with thundering detonations. When I went outside now, the smoke from the burning city sliced through my nostrils and lungs like a jagged blade edge. The streets were full of both debris and bodies, although the bodies were hardly recognisable as such. The corpses of both soldiers and civilians who had been killed in the shelling and bombing were under debris, and everything was covered with a grey and red powder from the destruction of the buildings. The stink of death was suffocating. We had no way to dispose of the bodies or even to collect them, because we were under constant air and artillery bombardment and infantry fighting was now everywhere.
The city smelled like a battlefield, which in fact it was with the smell of the plaster and brick dust from disintegrating buildings, of burning wood, of burned gunpowder, of gasoline, and of decomposing corpses. Fortunately, the nights were still cool, so the smell of death was still just bearable. When I made the trip to Führer headquarters now, approximately one kilometre, I had to dart from cover to cover, watching not only for incoming artillery rounds, but for rifle and machine gun fire as well. From our command bunker, I went straight up Bendlerstrasse to the Tiergarten, then along the south side of the park, or through it. The Russians were already in parts of the park, and they fired at all movement, then on to the southwest coma of the Reich Chancellery across from the park. I would enter the bunker from the basement of the Chancellery. Some of the SS troops defending the Chancellery were dug in before the building. At night, both sides would shoot at any movement. To the people at Führer headquarters, we represented the outside world. Nobody there had left the bunker for several days. They were safe in the bunker, with its many feet of concrete under many feet of earth. But they did not know what was going on outside, that the fighting was only a kilometre away, or that the rescuing armies had been halted. Hitler and the High Command were juggling divisions that no longer existed, or were just skeletons of themselves. Every time I came into the bunker, Martin Bormann especially was eager to know what was happening. He was always there, in the big antechamber in front of Hitler's office and living quarters. Every time I came in, he would insist that I sit down on one of the green leather chairs and have some of his goodies and tell him about the situation on the outside. It was very important to him to know the situation on the outside before anyone else did. As a civilian chief of staff to Hitler, he had a reputation for being a ruthless intriguer. Everyone knew his power, and everyone had a certain fear of him because he had constant access to Hitler, but he was not held in high esteem by military leaders. The effort to supply us by air had practically ceased, since the east-west axis, the parade avenue through the Tiergarten, was now under constant mortar fire. The last plane that had landed did not make it off the ground again, and was still sitting there, crippled by enemy fire. It was impossible to land ammunition for 50,000 men, let alone to parachute it in. The airdrops had produced only six tons of supplies. Above all, there was no way to distribute them to the troops. The situation was such that we still had control of an area shaped like a dumbbell. In the east, we had an area of about three kilometres in diameter, with the Reich Chancellery in the centre. The shaft of the dumbbell was the Heerstrasse, about eight kilometres long, which was being crossed from time to time by Russian tanks. In spite of that, the subway tunnel under it was still a safe connection to the west, where we still controlled an area of about three kilometres in diameter surrounding the Olympic Stadium. The fighting out there was being done by the Hitler Youth, who, with exceptional courage, were keeping open the Pichelsdorf Bridge for a possible breakout to the west. The main push of the Russians was directed toward the centre of Berlin, which they had attacked from the south, east and north. For some reason, they had not hit upon the simple idea of attacking along the Heerstrasse, which they could reach without much effort, moving cast and just driving through the Brandenburg Gate into the centre of the city. The city's defenders, the remnants of our 56th Panzer Corps and General Monker's 1,000 SS troops defending Führer headquarters were red-eyed and sleepless, living in a world of fire, smoke, death and horror. Much of Berlin was burning like a bonfire, the fighting was being shared by soldiers and civilians alike. When the shelling got bad, the women queuing up for water would press closer to the building walls to hold their places in line. Since such a front could not possibly be held for more than a few days, Weidling decided to make a determined plea to Hitler to break out as long as the route to and across the Picheisdorf Bridge remained open. Once again, von Doffing and I went over the plan to break out of Berlin to the west and northwest, across the Picheisdorf Bridge. We worked through the night, preparing the necessary orders and issuing them to the divisions. Only the codename Spring Storm was necessary to set everything in motion, our plan to break out in three groups promised real safety for Hitler and the other occupants of Führer headquarters. A group of SS shock troops with about a dozen self-propelled guns would open the way. The 25 or so tanks that were still operational would surround the armoured personnel carriers containing Hitler and his entourage to provide flank protection – 
and the infantry now fighting the Russians in the eastern sectors of Berlin would provide the rear guard. The plan was to start at midnight and be out of the city by morning. We had broken out of encirclement before, in Silesia, and we knew that those riding and armoured personnel carriers in the centre of such a fighting force would get through safely. Once out of Berlin, we would have to march for a few days to the northwest, toward Lübeck. The Russian air force was not a big threat, because it was not very efficient, although it would certainly lob some bombs at us. At about noon, General Weidling and I took the maps and departed for Führer headquarters outside. Conditions were more dangerous than ever. Since morning the Russians had held the Liechtenstein Bridge, and before the day was over the entire Tiergarten would be in Russian hands. Russian artillery shells were exploding everywhere, causing the earth to tremble and sending dirt, pavement, bricks and other debris high into the air to fail back to earth and injure anyone below. The roar of flames from burning buildings and the crunching sound of falling walls were terrifying. We dashed from doorway to doorway in short bursts to avoid not only shrapnel and other debris from the artillery shells, but also rifle and machine gun fire. At 28, I did not find the running especially strenuous. At 57, General Weidling had a more difficult time. We no longer had to surrender our pistols at Führer headquarters because we were so well known. When we arrived at Hitler's headquarters, several flights of stairs below ground level, the situation briefing had just begun. General Weidling was announced to Hitler and immediately admitted to the briefing room. I waited in the large outer chamber with detailed maps that Weidling might need. The bunker smelled damp and the sound of the small engine that ran the exhaust system provided a constant background noise. The ever-present Martin Bormann accosted me again. I had one of Bormann's sandwiches and filled him in on the battle that was being waged above ground. After about 45 minutes, the meeting in the briefing room ended, Hitler emerged, followed by Dr. Goebbels, General Krebs, General Weidling and some other people. I saluted and Hitler walked toward me. As he neared, I was shocked by his appearance. He was stooped and his left arm was bent and shaking, half of his face drooped, as if he'd had a stroke, and his facial muscles on that side no longer worked. Both of his hands shook and one eye was swollen. He looked like a very old man, at least twenty years older than his fifty-six years. Weidling presented me to Hitler. Major Knapper, my operations officer. Hitler shook my hand and said, Weidling has told me what you are going through. You have been having a bad time of it. Being accustomed to saying Jawohl, Herr General, I automatically said Jawohl, Herr, and then, realising that this was wrong, I quickly corrected to Jawohl, mein Führer. Hitler smiled faintly, and Goebbels smiled broadly but Weidling frowned because his subordinate had made a social error. Hitler said goodbye, shook my hand again, and disappeared in the general direction of Goebbels's quarters. Although his behaviour had not been lethargic, his appearance had been pitiful. Hitler was now hardly more than a physical caricature of what he had been. I wondered how it was possible that in only six years, this idol of my whole generation of young people could have become such a human wreck, it occurred to me then that Hitler was still the living symbol of Germany, but Germany as it was now. In the same six years, the flourishing, aspiring country had become a flaming pile of debris and ruin. Weidling and I left the bunker through the basement hallways of the Reich Chancellery. We had found a safe passage through the basement all the way to a window facing Hermann Göringstrasse. Did he approve the plan? I asked with trepidation. The answer was no, Weidling said angrily but it was the way he did it. This man whom I had seen remain calm under even the most adverse circumstances was so furious that his voice quivered. He listened to my proposal, and then he said, No, Weidling, I do not want to risk dying in the streets like a dog. Our soldiers have been dying in the streets of Europe for the past six years at his command. For him to imply now that such a death is somehow dishonourable is loathsome. Weidling was so angry that he was throwing caution to the wind, if someone had overheard and reported what he had just said to me, his life would have been in very great danger. But our men had been dying in the streets of Berlin every day and every night since we had arrived in the city, and they had died in the streets of other cities before Berlin. For Hitler to be so disrespectful toward the men who were sacrificing their own lives every day just to keep him alive one more day filled me with anger also. Many men who had served under my command had died since the beginning of the war,
My own brother had died for Führer and Fatherland. No wonder Weidling was angry. We had both been in the war from the beginning, and we had both seen countless deaths in our almost six years of war. As soldiers, we had accepted death, even our own, if it came as a natural part of our lives. We accepted it as a price we had to pay for a cause we had thought just, at least in the beginning. We were perhaps only now, at the last possible moment, beginning to see clearly what kind of man we had been following. When I reported to the Führer bunker the next day with the daily situation map, and saw Hitler going from one room to another in the bunker, my hand moved involuntarily toward my pistol. I had a terribly strong urge to kill him and stop all the suffering. It would have been easy to do, since he had no personal bodyguards inside the bunker. I would not have got out alive since SS guards were at all the entrances and exits, but I could easily have killed him. Certainly it was not fear of death that stopped the movement of my hand to my pistol. With the escape plan out of the question, my fate was sealed and unavoidable. The Russians had been shooting captured German officers following every battle in their march across Germany. My life would undoubtedly be over in a few days in any case. In the instant I had to make a decision, I must have instinctively concluded that I should not risk making a martyr of Hitler and possibly creating another Dolchstoss Legenda. By late April we no longer had any chance of defending Berlin, the horrible, hopeless battles in the streets continued, but our divisions were little more than battalions. Our morale was poor and our ammunition was almost gone. Theoretically we had four divisions with which to defend the city, but in fact the divisions were at less than half strength, and that included many wounded. By including Hitler Youth and Volkssturm we may have had enough bodies to man four full divisions. But the Volkssturm was staffed by old men and the Hitler Youth was composed of children, although some Hitler youth were somewhat effective in defensive positions. Even if we'd had four fully staffed, experienced and rested divisions, we were still a core fighting two army groups, and on top of everything else, we knew we would receive no more ammunition. Being outdoors in the city was becoming more dangerous, because Russian tanks were now driving around the city, German tank hunter groups were chasing them with Panzerfausts, and both were shooting wildly in all directions. To go any place in the city now meant darting from cover to cover, from doorway to doorway, climbing over and around the piles of debris and the decomposing bodies that littered the streets. When a soldier walks over and around and sometimes inadvertently on human corpses daily, his sensibilities start to numb. I was beginning to wonder if we could still be called human. The loud roar of combat filled our days and our nights. We could usually detect from the sound what kinds of weapons were being fired. Mortars sounded slow, artillery shells were a little faster, and heavy artillery was much faster. Of course, the detonation of heavy artillery was much louder than that of light artillery and mortars. We could also tell the direction a shell was coming from by its sound, and we could tell by the sound whether it would pass over our heads or hit in our vicinity. After a while, our senses were automatically tuned to these sounds, and our reactions became instinctive. We still had not given up on the idea of breaking out of Berlin. It was obvious that a breakout could succeed only as long as we could get to the Pickelsdorf Bridge without heavy fighting. The divisions urged us to begin the breakout soon. The morale of the men leaped when they learned about the possibility of a breakout. Weidling kept urging Krebs to press Hitler on the subject, but Krebs said that Hitler could not be made to change his mind. Hitler's refusal frittered away precious hours and days while the Russians constantly reinforced the ring around Berlin, especially to the west of the city. April 29, the Russians were less than 500 metres from the Reich Chancellery. I could hardly steal a full hour of sleep. There was always work, reports to receive and consolidate, orders to write, instructions to give, maps and sketches to draw, phone calls to take and make, and endless other details to take care of. We learned that Wenck's 12th Army had been beaten back conclusively, and with that any hope for a military change was gone. Everybody now wanted to place hope in a political change brought about by increasing friction between the Western Allies and the Russians, but could that be of any help to us at this point, even if it happened? Weiss, Freytag Loringhoff and Bolt answered this question in the negative when they left the sinking ship during the afternoon, through the subway tunnel and across Lake Wannsee, to carry Hitler's last will and testament out of Berlin. However, they did not mention anything about their plans to me.
even though I talked with them daily. I learned about their departure only after they had gone. At Bendlerstrasse, individual members of the staff who had no immediate job to do were having parties, dancing on the volcano, so to speak with the women auxiliaries for signal duties. It was a relief to me to again submerge myself in my work. In another area, a feverish activity developed. Everybody wanted to take advantage of being so close to the personnel department of the Supreme Command of the Army to get bigger decorations and even a promotion. Von Dufing was promoted to Oberst at this time, and he surely had earned it, but other promotions were given very generously now at the last moment. Decorations, too, were processed rather quickly if they were related to bravery in the fight for Berlin. Several times I saw 14- and 15-year-old Hitler Youth members pick up their iron crosses for destroying Russian tanks. Weidling was considering trying the breakout on his own if Führer headquarters did not want to come along. It was a difficult decision for him to make, however, and he could not quite come to grips with it. We had almost given up any hope of getting out of the rubble and debris that was now Berlin, when suddenly on the morning of April 30th a call came from Führer headquarters. One of the cables actually was functioning for a change, requesting that I come over immediately and report again about the time calculations of the breakout plan. I left immediately, through the springtime foliage of the Tiergarten, the shells burst without interruption, destroying everything in their immediate vicinity and small arms fire was everywhere. Blinding sunshine lay over a gruesome scene, on the lawns of the Tiergarten under mutilated age-old trees, I could recognise artillery pieces, all put out of action by direct hits. The gunners who had not made it were lying around, so mutilated they were hardly recognisable as human remains. Everywhere in the streets the dead were visible among the piles of dust-covered debris. Empty shoes lay here and there. I remembered the first combat dead I had seen in France so long ago, and how shocked I had been at the sight. Now my sensibilities were so numb that a corpse was little more than an obstacle to step over. In those moments, when I paused to catch my breath or to let a salvo of artillery shells get over with, I could see in gruesome detail the outlines of a human torso, or part of one, between fragments of bricks, rocks and concrete. However, I could not let such observations distract me. I had to try to get in one piece across Hermann Göringstrasse with my papers. Maybe Hitler had decided after all to make the breakout. This time I did not have to endure Bormann's courtesies. General Krebs was waiting for me in the Führer's conference room. I laid out my maps and made another presentation on our intended breakout. Krebs then asked a lot of questions about the details of our time calculations. He was especially interested in the amount of advance notice that had to be given to the divisions before the beginning of the operation. I told him that we had everything prepared so that we could start tonight if the order went out this very moment, but that fourteen hours of start-up time was required. A quick decision was necessary if the breakout was to be successful tomorrow night could be too late. Krebs indicated that Hitler was still opposed to a breakout, but Krebs wanted to try again to change his mind. We would hear from him about the results, so all our hope had been for nothing. He had not even approached Hitler about it. With a very heavy heart, I returned to Bendlerstrasse. The hours went by without anything happening, without word from Führer headquarters to dispatch the code name to put the divisions in motion. Then it was noon for tonight. It was now too late, and tomorrow, perhaps, it would be too late altogether. Still, the front was holding firmly almost inexplicably. Why did the Russians insist on attacking at all the most difficult places, across the Spree River at the Charité Hospital and across the Landwehr Canal at the Lotzewufer, at Potsdam Square and in Leipziger Strasse, where General Monker's SS units defended the immediate surroundings of the Reich Chancellery. The Russians apparently wanted to conquer the Reichstag and the Reich Chancellery as quickly as possible. It was lucky they did not know that the easiest way would have led them very quickly and directly to their goal. Each time I drew a new situation map, it was a puzzle to me why the Russian general staff could not recognise that. During April 30, the Russians captured the Reichstag and then concentrated on the few hundred metres to Führer headquarters against fierce resistance. General Monker's SS troops and the remnants of our 56th Panzer Corps were defending the bunker valiantly. Even though their own deaths could be the only possible result of their continuing to fight, still they fought on. At about 7pm, 
An aide of General Krebs arrived with an order for Weidling to come with a small working staff to Führer headquarters. Whatever that might mean, it was a change, and there was hardly anything now that could make things worse. Weidling decided to take von Duffing, a clerk and a liaison officer along. I was to stand by and follow the next morning at the latest, with the latest situation map. At around 6 a.m. on May 1, Major Kirsch, our liaison officer with General Monker, arrived from Führer headquarters. He reported very strange things. Incredibly, Weidling was apparently being held there against his will, under something like house arrest. I took my maps and set out again on the horrible trip to Vossstrasse, as Weidling had instructed me before he left. In the conference room of the Chief of the General Staff of the Army, I met Weidling, von Duffing, and the others from our staff. Weidling somehow looked completely different. Something had happened that had thrown this man, who could not be discouraged even in the most hopeless situation in battle, completely out of kilter. Weidling informed me quietly that Goebbels had told him last night that Hitler, after first marrying Eva Braun, had taken poison, together with his wife, and shot himself. None of us had known about Eva Braun before, but now it occurred to me that she must have been among the women in the bunker whom I took to be secretaries. The corpses were rolled in carpets, drenched with gasoline, and burned in the courtyard of the Reich Chancellery, so that they would not fall into the hands of the Russians' Goebbels had Weidling come to the bunker so he could continue leading his troops from there, I was stunned. For some reason it had never occurred to me that Hitler would commit suicide. If he planned to commit suicide, why had he not done it long ago, when it was obvious that the war was lost? Why had so many people had to die so senselessly, right up to the moment the Russians were knocking on the bunker door? Such selfishness was unbelievable to me night before, Von Duving and Krebs had gone to the Russians to explore the conditions for a surrender. Both spoke Russian, but the Russians had insisted on unconditional surrender. Von Duving then told me the details about his trip across the front lines. After Hitler's death, Krebs had immediately got in touch with the Russian command by radio and asked whether a German delegation could cross at Wilhelmstrasse to talk to them. Krebs, who was a former military attaché in Moscow, walked with von Duffing along Wilhelmstrasse, partly through the subway tunnel. They were received by Russian officers and driven to General Chukov's staff headquarters. Although their conduct was correct, the Russians were adamant in their demand for unconditional surrender and for extradition of Hitler, whose death was not yet known to them, Goebbels and all other non-soldiers responsible for the war. The next morning, Krebs gave his consent to begin the breakout during the night of May 1. Weidling gave Riefier the order to issue the code name to our divisions. It was now too late for a massed, centrally-led breakout in one direction, so breakouts were to be made individually by each division. Beginning at 9.30pm, Weidling also gave each division commander and each soldier the choice to either join the breakout action or to go into Russian captivity. In talking with General Major Monka, Feidling and I learned that SS Brigade Monka intended to leave at about 9.30pm, gather at the subway station at Friedrichstrasse, and break out in a northerly direction. Weidling decided that our Corps staff would join this group, and he instructed me to have our Corps staff personnel ready to leave Bendlerstrasse at 8pm. We would, of course, have to fight our way through to the Reich Chancellery in order to join Monka's group. The Reich Chancellery personnel, or those who were left, also intended to join this group. Krebs and Bergdorf decided to stay and take their own lives. During my walks through the Reich Chancellery this day, I saw wounded people everywhere who were being cared for by Army Medical Corpsmen and by Red Cross nurses. SS men were helping themselves to such delicacies as canned sausages and soda or beer. It was obvious that the end had finally arrived. Plans were being made now by individuals rather than by commanders. At 7.30pm, I sat down to a last supper with all those from Hitler's immediate entourage who were still present in the Führer bunker. I was probably the only outsider in the group. Sitting around a large table with me were Martin Bormann, Admiral Foss, a liaison officer representing Admiral Donitz, Ambassador Huell, a liaison officer representing Foreign Minister von Ribbentrop, and four or five women whose identities I do not recall, but who must have been secretaries. There were also two or three other people. We had tea, army bread, corned beef and canned liverwurst.
The conversation, of course, was about the forthcoming breakout through the Russian lines. Since I was an experienced combat officer, and therefore an expert in this group, I was bombarded with all kinds of questions. 